So explain um, explain iced coffee as opposed to my preferred breakfast drink, which is bourbon and hot coffee. Okay, well, I think... You don't have to comment on my preferences, but, yeah. but why are we drinking iced coffee? Uh, I love iced coffee. Hot coffee's disgusting. It's kind of, And it's homophobic. It's disrespectful to gay culture. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, I can't. I no what, one's ever what, asked what's, me. What's the history? Like I learned this from you. What the history of this is mysterious, but apparently gay men drink cold iced coffee. Yeah, it, it's very much a thing. Even if it's twenty very culturally, degrees out. even if it's winter. I used to go uh, when I was working at the Examiner. I would leave the office and like the cold of winter, s- like scuttle across the street to the Starbucks, come out with two large cold iced coffees. My hands would freeze off while I scuttled back across the street. And then I put them in the fridge and drink them throughout the day. Yeah. It's just a thing. I don't know. It's one of those things where it's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? It's like, I don't know. I honestly couldn't tell you why it, why it is. I think it might have just been initially like counterculture or something. Like, yeah. it was very much kind of coffee snobs drink like all their different flavors of like hot coffee. But iced coffee is kind of not like that. So... I don't know. I don't know what it came from, but now it's like very viciously defended. Well, you're actually uh, speaking of coffee snobs. Like uh, Starbucks cold brew is is by far their best coffee, yes. and and I don't really actually like most of their hot coffees. So I am that coffee snob. So so well done. I like so the thing about Starbucks is I I really only like their cold coffees. Like their coffees because it's a little more bitter. It's it's it just suits an iced coffee much better. Yeah. Whereas like Duncan's iced coffee is really bad. Very, and I'm, so I'm from New England. So all I ever had was Massachusetts has more Dunkin' Donuts in the state of Massachusetts than in the rest of the United States combined. So there's a Dunkin', there's two Dunkins at every intersection in Massachusetts. So I grew up drinking Dunkin'. And then when I like moved elsewhere and started drinking other kinds of coffee, I realized Dunkin' was watered down, extremely weak coffee. Yeah. And so now I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> weak iced coffee is is perhaps the worst thing. Watery iced coffee yeah. is yeah. should be illegal. And this, I mean, we're we're not just talking about this for no reason. Um, this leads us directly into the first major scandal of the new Biden administration, because yeah. Pete, Pete Buttigieg was spotted drinking a hot coffee. Right, he's supposed to be this LGBTQ pioneer, right? He's supposed to be out there representa- representing the community, and the online gays were all up in uh, arms because he was out there with his hot, plain, black Starbucks coffee, and they were like, ew. Yeah. They, they're like, why did Chastin let you do that? Yeah. Um, um, and, and that, of course, distract us from some, some really bad things that he actually did talk about. Um, he uh, sort of mindlessly... Uh, defended the Jones Act and and you said he's he's talking about a gas tax yeah he talked about a gas tax increasing it which is supposedly a a very regressive tax so I don't know when that became progressive to support things that hurt poor people the most but and then he immediately walked it back right after his spokesperson put out a statement and was like actually we're just kidding about that thing he just said at the confirmation hearing so not a great start for Pete Buttigieg and then yeah he angered even his neoliberal supporters with this kind of politicians defense of the Jones Act, which uh, has all these restrictions on shipping and no policy experts left or right really think it's a defensible idea. But they he just, uh, I guess, is sticking to it for political reasons. I assume he got certain talking points um, that that were handed down from the machine. And by the way, I don't think it's a Democratic machine. The Jones Act is equally defended by dumb Republicans. So uh, but we are uh, two days is this the second day of the Biden administration, I believe, and you had to deal with getting to the studio, you had to deal with mm-hmm. uh, the remaining roadblocks. Uh, we've been in military lockdown in my neighborhood. It's kind of creepy seeing military vehicles driving up and down your one-way street, even though they're driving both ways. Um, but I thought what we'd do is talk about Joe Biden's first couple days and his first 100 days. He has a very expansive agenda. For sure. Um, and hopefully we can find a little bit of good in there, but I know there's a lot of bad and ugly as well. And uh, we, we can go wherever you want, but you just wrote a piece on, on the XL pipeline yeah, as a great example. I think it's funny, tragic. I'm trying to, to get a smile about some of these things that the very first thing that Joe Biden did essentially was start a trade war with, with Canada. I assume a wall between 
Canada and the United States is forthcoming. Yeah, it was honestly, I guess not surprising, but disappointing because I really like the things Joe Biden has to say. When he's out there giving his speeches about unity, his inauguration speech, his acceptance speech shortly after the election, you know, coming together, setting aside the divisiveness, I really liked what he had to say in his inauguration speech about Trump supporters are not your enemies, right? But there's this big message of unity, but it really only looks like empty virtue signaling when you look at the fact that on his very first day, he signed 11 executive orders, right? He just went right to work, reversing on all sorts of hot topics. Which is a record, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, the first in American history to do that many on their first day. Usually they do like one or two. And so one of them was the Keystone uh, Pipeline. He blocked it after all these years. And it's actually, it's just a blatant pander to, I guess, the environmentalist left because it's actually going to be worse for the environment. When you block the pipes, the pipeline, which carries oil, they're going to send it by rail instead, which mm -hmm. is actually more likely to spill is more likely to emit, it has higher carbon emissions, and it will kill, you know, 11,000 jobs, 1.6 billion in wages, but whatever. I mean, he'll get some nice statements from progressive environmentalist groups, but it's just, it's part of a broader thing where he's hitting the ground running with, he's not a, a leftist Bernie Sanders Marxist, but he's, he's coming out there with a pretty sweeping liberal agenda from day one, and he's doing it in a partisan and divisive manner that really belies a lot of this unity talk. Yeah, and... And well-known right-winger Justin Trudeau came out and, and attacked, you tweeted this, so I'm stealing your line. Um, and he's basically threatening, um, because this is a huge hit to the Canadian e economy if, if it does in fact happen, and he's going to hit us back with, with trade restrictions. We've, we've been doing this, but I think it's sort of funny. You know, one of, the, one of the things I think that libertarians were hoping from the Biden administration was a more reasonable approach on trade and, and, and immigration. And um, I'm, I was more skeptical of it because those same anti-trade forces exist on the left. I mean, Bernie's just as much of a protectionist as Donald Trump was. Yeah, so I think on immigration, we can talk about this because that might be a bright spot. Biden has a new immigration plan out. That is, there is some good stuff there. But he, on trade, I think he'll just go whatever way the wind blows. And this keystone, so I think he's generally going to be pro-trade, in a, at least nominally. But then whenever there's kind of a woke cause, like environmentalism or unions or, you know, racial justice, things that can get in the way of that with the progressive grassroots... I imagine he will cave even when the actual facts, like, for example, if you're an environmentalist, like Justin Trudeau is a lefty who cares about climate change, right? He still supports the pipeline because yeah. the facts show that it would not worsen emissions. The Obama administration looked, they evaluated this project five times and found it would not impact emissions. But it's it's just become kind of a, a token, same way with many of his other executive orders. Some were fine, some were insignificant, some were bad, but all of them were immediately on day one checking boxes for the progressive left or for, for his base. And you can look at it, too, with his uh, COVID stimulus, right? Mm -hmm. He went out, one of his first acts of business he wants is a $1.9 trillion covid stimulus package and he's saying you know unity fight the virus come together but he's putting partisan poison pills like a 15 dollar federal minimum wage into his unity bill so uh, to me it, it's just frustrating because i want to like the guy i want to give him an open mind a chance but he makes it really hard when his actions are so much louder than his words yeah my i, I think we have the same attitude my attitude about a candidate um is very different than my attitude about a president because once it's done you hope for the best and you fight for the best and you certainly hold them accountable and and i tried to do that with the trump administration which i did not support in 2016 and i would i would try to do it here but this uh, let's talk about the minimum wage and then i want to i want to go back to the speech and, and parse it a little bit to to dig a little bit deeper of what you were saying but the the, the timing for a $15 minimum wage right now as a, all of these small businesses, not the big guys, but the small guys have been locked down for almost a year now. It seems like a knife in the side. Right. Why, to explain the minimum wage for people that apparently don't understand economics. So the minimum wage is something that a policy that would be bad and counterproductive in the best of times. I mean, it's really as simple as this. If the government mandated the cost of Coca-Cola was doubled tomorrow, 
people would buy less Coca-Cola, right? It's really as simple as that with the minimum wage. wage. Wages are the price of labor. If you artificially mandate a huge spike in that price, employers will purchase less labor. It's, it's, it, it, obviously, the debate goes into levels and levels, but it's actually as simple as that. Uh, and so the Congressional Budget Office, which is nonpartisan, found that 1.3 to 3.7 million jobs would be eliminated by a federal national minimum wage. Now, like you said, that was before COVID. That yeah. was before any of this. That was just in normal times assumptions. So that's pretty bad, right? Now imagine that we're in a scenario where 100,000 small businesses have closed their doors since the beginning of March lockdowns and COVID. 60% of small businesses, nearly 60%, say that they don't think they'll make it through June of 2021. Now you're going to take all these small businesses across the country uh, that have they're on the brink of collapse because of what the government has done to them and because of the virus and the toll it's taken on their community and their ability to earn an income and just double or at least 50% increase their wage bill, which is their biggest expense. Payroll is the biggest expense for many companies. So it's just a nightmare. It's a recipe for more people losing their jobs. It's a recipe for businesses going under. And the really, it's honestly bizarre to me because this is a policy, a federal $15 minimum wage, that Hillary Clinton rejected in 2016 when she was running for president. Yeah. And now, and now all of a sudden Biden's making her look like our fiscal conservative hero, right? So at the same time that he's not this leftist Marxist that Bernie Sanders is, he's really moved solidly to the left. And from day one, he's pursuing this sweeping liberal economic agenda. It's a, it's a progressive religious tenet that is impervious to to economic reasoning and and I, I just reminded and this will this will age me horribly but you're you're the editor at the foundation for economic education and, and you and john miltmore miltmore mm -hmm. yeah is that how you say it um you guys are killing it and and I, I love the content and everybody watching this should definitely follow you guys at, at fee.org um and while you're there you can check out an article that i wrote um, long before you were born, um, in the 1980s. Don't tell me when you were born, because it'll upset me. But uh, Walter Williams, who was a professor of mine at George Mason University, had just published a, a book um, entitled, I think, um, South Africa's War Against Blacks, or War Against Capitalism, South Africa's War Against Capitalism. And at the time, we were debating apartheid and, 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 and all of that stuff. And Walter, um, the famous black economist, uh, talked about the minimum wage his entire life. And one of the things he points out in this book is that apartheid South Africa, their, their most potent weapon against black and other people of color was a high minimum wage that kept all of the jobs in the white community. That's an uncomfortable fact for my progressive friends. It is, and, and I think it's one of the key elements of the minimum wage. When you look at who it hurts, is actually the same groups that is supposed to be uh, ostensibly the progressive coalition. Women, teenagers, African Americans and minorities. These are the people who are the marginal workers in the sense that the uh, any policy starts at the margin, right? So the first worker to get the axe on a minimum wage hike is the one that's been there the least, the one that's earning uh, the, the, the most or the least for that bracket. It's, it's a marginal worker. It's not the really well-off kind of well-connected people who are hurt right away by government policies, right? It's the ones who are just getting in or just new to the industry. Uh, and so that means that this is a well-documented trend. The minimum wage leads to higher minority unemployment, higher female unemployment. Uh, and now the minimum wage is actually a pretty small sector of our economy. It's still millions of people's work. But so it's not the end of the world, right? I, I was talking about this the other day with someone and a fifteen minimum fifteen dollar minimum wage would be really bad for the economy, but ultimately the sun would still rise in the next day. The thing though is it would have long term impacts on the economic opportunity and prospects of these groups at the margin, female employment, minority unemployment, 
all these things that uh, love him or hate him before COVID-19, President Trump had record had. And it's not just him. Right. It's the whole economy. But he had overseen reforms that had driven us to the lowest uh, record lows in minority unemployment and female unemployment. These kinds of policies will make sure we never get back to that anytime soon. Yeah, and and I was thinking of a another potential outcome that I, I would be pretty confident in. During the lockdowns, we saw a substantial shift away from mom and pop businesses towards uh, mega companies like Amazon.com, and I I sort of get that if you if you you're literally not allowed to open up your business, I'm and I'm not allowed out of my house or whatever those those rules were. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but if I'm McDonald's and you can see this, I'm my, my dirty little secret is I love McDonald's. You love, I love McDonald's cream. breakfast. Yes. Yes. And, uh, when you go into your favorite McDonald's now, um, people have been replaced by kiosks, robots, yep. and I now order my own food and it, it, it spit out of some robot tunnel. And uh, mom and pop businesses are not going to be able to replace people with robots the way the big boys are going to, which means that you're going to see further concentration in big mega corporations. And instead of your local Italian joint, we're all going to eat, eat McDonald's. Yay. Well, <laughs> not, well, that, not, the not how they think about it. That sounds... Just shed a tear <laughs> for our waistlines. <laughs> No, but it's a good point, right? Because one of the people, one of the lies of progressive economics is that big government is there for the little guy. In reality, it's very telling that big government regulations in the tech sector are often endorsed by the tech giants. <laughs> Labor regulations are often endorsed and helped crafted by the big boys, uh, you know, the big real t retail retailers out there. Because think about it. Whether it's regulations, whether it's a minimum wage increase, the company's best able to ride the wave and get through it are the ones that have a thousand lawyers on staff that have a budget in the hundreds of millions. It's not, you know, the corner diner run by Aunt Susan. So something like at Target, for example, if there was a $15 national minimum wage, they would have to decrease hours, reduce unemployment, reduce employment, shift around their schedule, probably would be a net negative for workers and for the company, but they wouldn't go bankrupt. They wouldn't close. Yeah. They would still be there tomorrow. It's your local store, your corner store, that might go under from that increase. They can't weather that. So all of these policies, whether it's big costly regulations or it's a huge mandatory spike in, in the wage rates far beyond what, what companies uh, actually value them on the market or can afford, these things enshrine big incumbents and big business. Um, and I guess that's kind of one of the interesting things about corporate America and even Wall Street to some extent is they've learned to love big government because big government loves them. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a great tool to uh, crowd out would be competition, and and we don't even know what that alternative is. But I, I think you see it in big tech, and and you definitely see it with uh, monsters like Amazon as well. Let's go back to executive orders, and I'm I'm thinking of all of those times during the Trump administration that I would tweet out uh, my opposition to. Um, an expansion of executive power. And every time um, conservatives or, or Trump supporters, I don't know if those are the same thing or not, they would, they would come back to me and, and, and call me un-American and sometimes worse <laughs> for, for calling out uh, the Trump administration. So, so a massive expansion of executive power under the Trump administration. He loved doing it that way. He didn't actually seem to have any interest in in working with Congress, even in the first two years when he had a more friendly Congress. And the Biden administration is now in charge. And they're like, hold my beer. Right. I'm, I'm going to go nuts on executive orders. Is anyone going to learn anything from this? Or are we just going to continue to concentrate power in the presidency? Well, this is the problem. You live by the executive order, you die by the executive order. And so many the only concrete gains of the trump presidency are things like the tax cuts which were great things like the judicial nominees all of those involve working with congress and getting votes done because those can't be undone easily at least yeah anything you accomplish via executive order which unfortunately includes a lot of the trump's administration's strong deregulatory record can be undone on day one so unless you have this naive notion that oh, the good guys, my team will be in party forever, which, yeah, right, uh, then governing by executive order is 
kind of pursuing temporary wins at long-term defeat in the sense that day one, Biden came in and overturned everything Trump did via executive order. Not everything, but more is to come soon. Mm -hmm. Whether it's, you know, rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, rejoining the World Health Organization, uh, reinstating protections for DACA, all these things which we can debate the merits of, we can discuss, but it's more, it's like, if you actually want to achieve change, executive orders are not going to cut it. Yeah. Uh, so I think Biden will do the same thing and he'll make the same mistakes, which may mean that in four years from now, if a Republican wins, it all gets undone again. And to some extent, that's just the partisan flow of Washington, D.C., but that's actually really bad because th think of the Keystone Pipeline example that we talked about a moment ago. Companies were looking at making this investment. They were told, yes, you can do it. Wait, no, you can't under Obama. Then Trump comes in and says, actually, yes, you can. Go ahead. Start building it. They start building it. Now Biden comes in and says, no, just kidding. Pack up, go home. You can't operate in that kind of yeah. environment with that kind of regulatory uncertainty and expect a thriving economy with lots of investment. That is, it, it, That makes investment harder. And, it, and investment is the key to long-term long -term economic growth. So it's a really unfortunate trend in a lot of ways, not just the short-term political ones. And by the way, it didn't start with Trump. I, I think you can you can easily track, and I'll just go back to the George W. Bush administration, lots of uh, expansion of executive power, and of course Obama ran with that with his pen and his phone. Uh, Trump expanded from there, and I think Biden's going to break all those records, and it, it sort of gets me back to what you said at the beginning about Biden's um, inaugural speech, and and I was, I was not as excited about it as you were I because I it, it just felt empty to me if that makes any sense and I've you know I've heard thousands of political speeches and I actually went back and I compared Biden's words not not to delivery and it's important to Trump's words from 2016 and it was shocking to me that a lot of those same phrases were in both speeches and and everybody's upset at me now because I said that but um, you know, we, we, we suggest that these two were so different, but Trump talked about unity. And he, he, he talked about a lot of the same things that, that Biden did, but it struck me that ultimately it was kind of like a Seinfeldian speech. It was a speech about nothing because you can, you can, you can talk about all those civic virtues, uh, unity and prosperity. And, and Biden actually said the word liberty is, is funny, he had that whole list right. of, of single word sentences and maybe he can't deliver an entire sentence coherently and maybe that's why they wrote the speech <laughs> that way. That was mean, but possibly true. But the thing that was missing from that speech that made the whole thing a lie is when he talks about democracy, he's essentially, we, we saved our democracy. He's saying, I won and that means that democracy is good. And that means that I get to do what I want. If you guys want unity, get in line, get on board. Because of the alternative would be, I'm gonna take a lighter hand. I'm not gonna do executive orders. I'm not going to force half of the country to live the way that my half of the country wants them to live. And of course, that would be a, a small L libertarian solution, right? Um, where we allow for families and communities and localities and states um, a lot of uh, conservatives like Mike Lee have, have offered this solution, but but Joe Biden's like, no, we're going to conform to the plan, and to me, that's a recipe for more violence, more anger, more division, less unity. Yeah. So I I guess the problem is that when he says unify, what he means is shut up and unify. Yeah. What, what he means is come stand next to me so we can be on common ground, right? <laughs> that's what he really means, if we're being honest. And that's not really what unity in any real sense should mean. Now, some people will say, well, he's calling for unity, but you can't expect him to not still believe in liberal and Democrat things. So it's not hypocritical. But it's not so much the agenda as much as it is the nature in which he's pursuing the agenda, the immediacy, the drasticness of it. I mean, I think as a nation, we could all use a couple months of exhaling, Yeah. right? A couple months without immediately launching into a giant culture war over immigration, a giant culture war over dozens of executive orders on hot topic social and cultural issues. And it seems like he's he's taking the opposite approach. He says, 
I'm going to put my foot on the gas as soon as I get behind the wheel. When in reality, we could all use a break. Yeah, yeah. And and ultimately, we got to get there. Like the, the fight to um, sit in the Game of Thrones. Did I say that right? Win the Game of Thrones to sit in the throne? Yeah, what's the what's the what's the throne called? The oh, the one with all the swords. I, anyway, I, I blew the analogy, but the Iron Throne. The Iron Throne. That's that's what it is. Um, we we don't talk about that show anymore. But um, we're all fighting, and it, this is sort of the naivete of both Trump Republicans and Biden Democrats. The theory is democracy only works if we're in charge, and um, the idea that one party would always be in charge is kind of ridiculous. And we know that it's not true. So you have this sort of seesaw effect of, uh, now we're going to do this, now we're going to do this. Um, one uh, additional thing that comes to mind that Biden did, I don't know if you noticed this, but he preemptively fired the chairman of the National Labor Relations Board, mm -hmm. I believe it's chairman, um, which is an unprecedented act. Um, no one's, no president, incoming president ever done that because they're essentially appointed for four-year terms. Um, but the unions wanted him to do it. So he's going to, again, expand executive power. And the net result of that is uh, next time Republicans take control, they'll be like, well, I guess that's how we do it now. And, yeah. and it's, it's further erosion of uh, that. And, and he seems to be um, just, he's checking off his list of all the political interest groups that helped me get elected. That's, that's not unity. No, that's uh, fan service. That's yeah. base pandering. And I worry about the influence that unions will have in a Biden administration, especially teachers unions, which I think will be remembered as, especially during COVID-19, one of the worst forces in American life today. That's teachers unions, not teachers. There's yeah. a big difference there. Right. But the unions are actively fighting to keep schools closed so they don't have to do their jobs. No matter how much science comes in showing schools are not COVID hotspots, very low rates of transmission, it's not dangerous. And keeping kids out of school is really bad, yeah. right? Trapping yeah. them at home, distance learning has been a total sham. Uh, so it's unfortunate because even Democrats, like polls, well, poll wise, want school choice, want open schools, but unions don't. And is that the, the direction that Biden, he said some things about opening schools, finally. But where he actually goes with that will be interesting. Is he even going to prioritize the interests of unions and his backers kind of from the political sense over the actual voters of the Democratic Party? Because where they're at on that issue is, is very far apart from uh, where the kind of the unions are. There was, um, there was a, I think it was, a, it was an executive order, but there was some definitive statement from the Biden administration on reopening schools that I think was linked to their overall COVID master plan. And the head of the teachers union celebrated it, even though they, as you said, they've so actively said, forget the science, we're not gonna open, right. we're in charge. Um, screw your kids. It's not about them. It's about us. So that was in the COVID, the massive COVID proposal that Biden put out. And that was, here's 150 billion. I think that's the number, but hundreds of billions of dollars for schools so they can reopen. But the money doesn't actually require them to reopen. I'd yeah. be maybe at least more open to it if it said, if you take this money, you must reopen your schools. There's no actual strings attached. So it's money to help schools improve COVID safety and reopen. And it's just basically a, a handout to these schools that are still closed. Yeah. So that's why the unions love it. It sounds great, but they're just going to get cash and then be in the same position they were before. So that's why they're celebrating that move. That's, uh, I want a job where I get paid no matter what, no matter the state of the economy, no matter state of, of my employer's budget, and no matter whether I'm willing to show up for work. But do you really want to work for the government? <laughs> I ask myself this sometimes, right? If there was some like amazing liberty candidate that won, would I want to go work for them in the White House or in the Senate or something like that? And I'm like, part of me would to effectuate change. But mm -hmm. part of me, I was like, I don't want to be a government employee. Yeah. Well, I'm already dirty. I, I worked for Congress for four years. And I would actually advise you to do it at some point. And you sort of have to steal yourself to not get corrupted um, by the the... The, the precious, as Thomas Massey would say, um, but don't stay for very long. Um, 
But this whole idea, and of course I'm being facetious, I, I think it's disgusting that, that the political class, um, above and beyond anybody else, has been untouched, unfazed by a year now of, of economic lockdowns. And it's sort of, it's, it's my, potentially my biggest pet peeve. And, and the teachers unions and government schools are sort of like ground zero for, um, I, I think it's a teachable moment for parents who thought they were public schools. And no, they're not public schools, they're government schools, and they work for themselves, not you or your children. Yeah, uh, and it's interesting because the idea of school choice would, would change this in the sense that they would have to satisfy parents and families to keep students at their schools. But when they're just uh, have a monopoly, they can do whatever they want. And it's a good point because I find this frustrating. There's few places, uh, rather than Washington, D.C., where people are more just default pro-lockdown, right? But when you ask why, it's because that person works for the federal government and their check comes in no matter what. Right. They're, they don't have a budget to balance that they have to cut your wages. Or I know a lot of people who had their wages reduced company wide salary reductions. I know a lot of people who lost their jobs. And these people at least can feel and see the costs of covid lockdowns indirectly or directly for much of the Washington political and government class. It's like, well, everyone they know is still employed and everyone they know still gets their paycheck. They just worked, switched to remote work and pushed their pencils virtually instead. So I guess to some extent it's an understandable blind spot, but it's it's a real moral failing to not empathize with others more, to not look outside your bubble more and think about all the small businesses that have closed, all the people who work in person who simply cannot do their jobs because they've been told that their livelihood is illegal, uh, and then they've been really kind of forgotten about or written off as collateral damage uh, in, in hopes of containing something. And the, the most frustrating part of it all is actually that, at least at the beginning, I started with the framework that this is going to have tons of costs, but at least it will contain the virus. Now we see many studies suggesting the lockdowns don't actually stop the spread of COVID-19 very well. And so you have people, the essential workers still go spread it. Even in, uh, th this infuriated more, me more than anything. In New York City, they shut down the restaurant industry after they had let it open, just briefly open with like 25% capacity. These people were getting a glimpse of daylight. They shut it down again, even though the data th from, the, from their own government official sources said only 1.4% of COVID trace cases could be traced to restaurants and bars. Yeah. They shut them all down again. Yeah. It's like sucks to suck business owners, entrepreneurs. Government's just swinging the hammer. It doesn't care if it misses the nail. Yeah, they, they keep embracing um, follow the science, follow the science. And and I just don't believe them when they say that because I remember all the way back, and, and there's a New York Times article about this, and it's a it's a it's it's like uh, COVID news of the day. So it's not an article specifically about this, but but Cuomo and the New York state government was was pledging allegiance to the data. And they had just released the, the latest data that showed the opposite of the theory of lockdowns, that, that people that were sheltering in place were more likely to contract and get sick COVID um, than essential workers, in, including like people in hospitals. So contrary to the entire theory, and all Cuomo said was, we didn't expect that. And then <laughs> proceeded forth, this was last April, and then proceeded forth for, for like the last eight months to do the same thing. And only a couple days before Biden became president, he said, we're, oh, des we're destroying. That. It's like, um, who is this dude that just said, we're destroying our businesses. We can't sustain this any longer. It's like, we've been talking about this for a year, dude. It's frustrating because you're already starting to see a switch, not just Governor Cuomo. That was infuriating. I saw that too. But even in the media, all of a sudden you're seeing the headlines. Do lockdowns actually work? Is it time to open up our businesses? Or it's like the, the tone is already changing. Yeah. And listen, I've, I've thought this whole time that every COVID death is serious. This is a very serious thing. But they've obviously taken a different approach, even just from day one of the Biden administration. It's not as some people said, the media will forget about COVID as soon as Biden is sworn in. That's not quite true. They're still talking about it. But the tone changes. The emphasis shifts. The, uh, the agenda that is allowed to be discussed shifts because fundamentally they wanted trump to lose 
And so if it bleeds, it leads. Every emphasis was on the negative, the worst possible things. And now they want Biden to be successful. And as do I, but I still would say that they should be objective and yep. or at least strive for it or pretend to be. And instead, unfortunately, we're already seeing some real media sycophancy yep. for the, the Bidens and, oh, look what they're wearing today. Or, oh, it's so nice to have... De uh, pro democracy truth tellers in charge again, and then you click on the person, and it's CNN reporter, and I'm like, excuse me, are are you, are you guys even pretending to be unbiased anymore? No. I would like it better if they just threw out the pretense, right? Really, because like I'm I'm a journalist, but I my articles are labeled opinion, right? I very much am open about the fact that I come at things with a perspective. What bothers me is not the lack of objectivity, but the pretense of right. it. And that's the problem with the media that I think is going to really trigger an enormous backlash after four years of resist media, which sometimes was warranted, often was not or was exaggerated. Now we're going to have four years of them sucking up to the Bidens and just worshiping the sand that they stand on. That's really going to rub a lot of Americans the wrong way. And it's going to fuel more siloing of our medias to only conservative media and only liberal media, which is not a good trend. Uh, and then it's going to fuel back, back, backlash. So yeah. if you want a recipe for tw Trump 2024 to be successful, it is media sycophancy of the Bidens for the next four years. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to treat Dr. Jill Biden with such reverence, maybe they should apologize for how they treated Melania. Because I, I, like, I wasn't a Trump supporter, but I'm like, what what basis? Like, it's it's just not right to just wail on her like that it, it was just disgusting to me um, because there should be like there should be a safe space in politics where um, we can just sort of appreciate um, what that stuff is and I say that as a libertarian I, I don't actually much respect anything that politicians do but it just seemed like too much it just seemed like extremely hostile and then it also seemed kind of like a giant double standard in that Attacks that the liberal journalists would decry as sexist applied to a Democrat politician, possibly rightly so. They would think we're fine when, uh, you know, dragging Melania yeah. or like making fun of her accent <laughs> or, you know, scrutinizing her wardrobe. They have this total double standard. I can still remember this is slightly different, but similar. The media establishment and the Democratic establishment hates Tulsi Gabbard who you and I both know and, and, and like, right? She's an, she's an anti-establishment, yeah. independent thinker, but she is a progressive. They wrote, the New York Times, the same fashion critic, wrote a scathing article about Tulsi Gabbard's cult-like pantsuits. But then when you looked back at 2016, she, that same writer, so not just the same publication, but the same specific writer, wrote a glowing article about Hillary Clinton's white pants suits and how they were iconic for feminists. Yeah. And that's the kind of stuff that makes you honestly want to just rip out, rip out your hair, smash the screen, and and turn away and never come back. Uh, and and that's the kind of thing I think we got to get ready for for the next three years. Where I don't know if Biden will do any wrong in these people's eyes. I did I did sort of pick on Hillary's pantsuits because they look shockingly like something that Chairman Mao would say, and and it, <laughs> and it triggered me. So, but it's funny you bring up Tulsi Gabbard because I wanted to to, to wrap up with something truly controversial that will upset everybody. And that's uh, Biden's executive order on LGBTQ, uh, specifically dealing with transgender stuff. And, and Tulsi Gabbard had, and I don't actually know exactly how to deal with this, as someone that is absolutely against uh, bigotry towards trans people, um, I'm skeptical of federal government involvement. I don't think this is a path forward. And she had, uh, before she left Congress, she had come out with some proposal that was uh, defending women's sports from trans participation. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it strikes me that the market solution for uh, a question like bathrooms is like, let's have um, unisex single stall bathrooms and let's let the market get to that point so we don't have to argue about who's in whose bathroom. It doesn't seem that hard to do. But what do you do about sports? So I, I think the first thing you hit on is the most important. I don't think there should be a one-size-fits-all federal rule. I think this should really be handled at the state and local level. Um, but it is a complicated question in the sense that nobody wants, uh, or at least you and I certainly don't, 
transgender students to be targeted or bullied or discriminated against, but also the follow the science crowd is now pretending there's no biological difference between people born male and born female. And even if you transition with hormones, there are still things like bone density and height and wingspan and uh, limb length and all sorts of things that don't change and alter fundamentally the equation in sports. So here's the thing that I think is important to highlight. If somebody is looking to ban transgender men from competing in male sports, transgender men are born biologically female, that is probably discriminatory because there's no scientific reason that that would be unfair. Just let them. If they want to be at a disadvantage and compete, be my guest. Now, if they're only looking to ensure that people who are born biologically male can't compete in female sports, there's some scientific merit to that, seriously, and we can't just dismiss it as bigotry, right? And that's the serious problem with the Democrats who are pushing this top down is that they're not even willing to entertain the idea that people could have good faith concerns about that. Yeah. But it is a delicate line because sometimes you'll see conservative media or politicians kind of react by talking about like men in dresses or predators in little girls locker rooms and like that is obviously not what we're talking about here either and kind of alarmist and unfair in some in many cases really so i think it's a tricky issue but i i really don't see why the feds should be making a rule for it at all yeah if anything local communities can probably figure that out best themselves it, it was perhaps the single biggest poke in the eye to to conservatives who are now going nuts about this, but it it has to be local and it has to be based on choice, not forcing people to accept things. I think, I think that puts us back. Um, but I also wonder, like, um, I, I sort of feel Tulsi Gabbard is right, that, that this is potentially the death of women's sports. Right. I mean, so just to give a personal example, I've been a lifelong soccer player and fan. Our, in, and in high school, our girls' soccer team was much comparatively better than the boys. The boys would win like 25% of our games. The girls would win like 50%. But if we played them head to head, we'd win seven mm zero. -hmm. There's just, there are differences. It's not bigoted to acknowledge that. It's just yeah. factual, yeah. right? So I think preserving it is important. It's not bigoted, but the whole debate has become very toxic and I really wish it wasn't a national culture war issue because one thing that frustrates me about this it's not that big of a deal. I mean, women's sports are important and should be protected, but like of all the policies, it feels like this kind of thing gets an extremely disproportionate focus from left and right. Yeah. It's like it's a wedge issue, a culture war barb they can use to brand the bigots on the other side or brand the crazy progressives. It's like at the grand scheme of things, why is this why is national bathroom debates or like locker rooms or sports, even a federal issue that we're talking about. In the grand scheme of things, leave it to localities and let them work it out. And it's really not that consequential. When we're talking about war and disease and e economics and millions of jobs, it's like, are we really going to spend, it just feels like we spend such a disproportionate amount of time screaming at each other over such a relatively minor and local issue. It's perhaps to distract us from the fact that we're about to spend $2 trillion more, <laughs> which, by the way, is, um, uh, you know, Biden administration coming in that's going to be fundamentally different than the Trump administration. The first thing they do is spend another $2 trillion. I feel like the Trump administration, very much driven by Nancy Pelosi, already passed um, many trillions of dollars. And so we're just doing the same thing over again, hoping for a different result. We are. And it's it's funny because it's like Team Red and Team Blue will switch, but the national debt clock will just keep going burr, 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 around and around and around. Is that what it sounds uh, like? I guess. And the money printer will go burr, burr, burr. Um, but it is what's going to happen. And it's depressing watching all these octogenarians, right? 78, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, I think is 80. It's like they're and, and also the Republicans, right, who are doing this, too. They're just spending, they're switching teams, taking turns, blowing away all our money. And it's like, it's not going to be them that's paying that off. That's going to be me, the Generation Z and our great grandchildren who are shackled with this the rest of our life. Uh, and they don't seem to care because they just care about the short term political incentives that they have to do something. Yeah. And, and most of the money that's being spent isn't even actually being spent well or efficiently. I mean, they've had massive fraud problems in the stimulus programs and all the different initiatives, and they just keep reauthorizing them and pouring more money into them without fixing them. 
So I think that tells you how serious Washington is about spending our money responsibly. The trillions more push, it's just a matter of looking like you're doing something. It doesn't address the actual problem, which is the economy on the supply side being strangled by lockdowns and restrictions. You could have a hundred trillion dollar stimulus bill and it wouldn't stimulate California that's in a, is still in a, a lockdown. So we got to get you out of the green zone, as we're called here on the Capitol, so you can get back and, and do another program. But where do people get the stuff you're working on right now? The easiest way is to follow me on Twitter, Brad underscore Palumbo, P-O-L-U-M-B-O. But people that like this show should also check out my podcast, Breaking Boundaries, on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It's a little bit like yours, except less alcohol. Uh, but the same kind of thing where I'm having guests, I'm not judging I'm... big picture conversations, uh, with, with people that matter. So we've had Rand Paul, we've had Glenn Greenwald. We'll be having, uh, taking a leaf out of your book, Tulsi Gabbard and, uh, Thomas Massey in the next nice. couple months. So if people are interested, they should check that out on Apple podcasts and Spotify. It's breaking boundaries. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Cool. That was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty, honest conversations with interesting people.